Welcome everyone. As director of the Atlantic Council's Africa Center, I'm so pleased to welcome you today uh, for the launch of our Green Growth and Climate Finance Report written by Mrs. Um, Emily Beth. For us, uh, climate is not trendy. It's a commitment, the center's expanding programming, um, but we envision something specific that African voices are represented in climate discussions. Not only represented, but also uh, they bring their solutions for themselves and for the rest of the world. Um, in a recent piece on our website uh, during the Climate Leaders Summit here in Washington, um, I said that um, I recall that while home to 15% uh, of the world's population, Africa is responsible for only 4% of global uh, carbon emissions. Um, of the seven countries in the world that emit two thirds of total greenhouse gas emission, none are African, according to Emily's report. Um, meanwhile, Africa faces droughts, floods, uh, declining agricultural um, productivity, deforestation, difficult access to water, rising seas, advancing deserts, and a rural exodus. Um, while Western countries seek to uh, reduce their carbon footprint, uh, African people are already on the front lines of the climate fight. But um, Africans um, from the Kyoto Protocol to the Paris Agreement, uh, African states have ratified all the environmental treaties. From the Blue Fund to the uh, President Makisal's Green Emerging Senegal Plan, they do a lot. Mobilizing billions in infrastructure will be necessary. This start uh, getting uh, the financing right. We are pleased to um, uh, welcome um, to have partnered on this report with uh, TDB, the Eastern and Southern African Trade and Development Bank, which shares in uh, our commitment to inclusive climate conscious African growth. I look forward to hearing uh, TDB CEO Admasu uh, Tadesu speak to this on our panel alongside other estimate guests from City, AOM Aris, uh, L'Agence Française de Développement, and the US International Development Finance Corporation. Allow me to uh, also personally congratulate Jake, uh, Jake Levin on his exciting new position as uh, the Chief Climate Officer of the DFC. Uh, Jake, thank you for choosing to speak at the Atlantic Council in your um, early days in, in this role. Um, now I'm thrilled to give the floor to uh, Emily Bell to provide a brief presentation of her report um, before turning to um, our senior fellow Aubrey Hubi to moderate um, the panel. Just uh, um, Emily is an international financial expert and a World Bank consultant. And it's, um, it was a pleasure to work with her on this Atlantic Council report. Emily, over to you. So many thanks, Ambassador Yad, for your kind introduction. Hi, everyone. So I'm Emily Biel, the author of the report. It's a great time to be talking about catalyzing finance in African markets, given the summit tomorrow in Paris on the sustainable financing of African economies. I was delighted to write this report and conduct interviews with international organizations and private sector representatives. Many thanks to them for their insights. I'm going to highlight in a few words the key findings of the report. It will be short since a very exciting panel with high level speakers is waiting to discuss the topic. First of all, I would like to underline that to face the climate emergency, to overcome the African shock of COVID-19 and to ensure that African economic development is sustainable, growth in Africa can only be green. The good news is that Africa is home to untapped potential. The continent possesses an abundance of natural resources, notably renewables, a dynamic demography and vibrant economic prospects. African countries, 90% of which have ratified the Paris Agreement and the rest of the international community are keenly aware of the need for green growth. Yet, capitalizing on this political will remains a challenge due to the persistent financing gap. Fostering growth will require mobilizing billions in investment for infrastructure. So what are the main highlights of the report? There are four of them that I'm going to outline. So first highlight, 
The infrastructure gap in Africa is an opportunity for green and resilient growth. There is an opportunity to reconcile economic development with climate change mitigation and adaptation in African markets by leapfrogging carbon dependent infrastructure and building green from the start. Other continents, and for, for example, Asian countries, have to adapt their existing infrastructure to lower their emissions. African countries face a different challenge, closing the infrastructure gap. Indeed, the continent's need for infrastructure amounts to between 130 and 170 billion dollars a year, with a financing gap of between 68 and 108 billion dollars. So let's close that gap by building new and green infrastructure. But infrastructure should not, should not just be green, it should also be resilient since disruptions due to poor maintenance and natural disasters have a significant cost. Energy infrastructure is a central part of the story. Nearly half of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa lack electricity compared to the global electricity control rate of, 30, of 19%. Numerous large clean energy projects are being developed. The Nour Warzazad Solar Complex in Morocco and the Nashtigal Hydropower Project in Cameroon are good examples. Yet to meet their significant electricity needs, African countries need to tap into all their abundant so green resources, that is to say their solar, wind, hydro, geothermal resources, to drastically increase both centralized and decentralized production capabilities. Second highlight, given the size of the infrastructure gap, mobilizing all sources of funding will be essential. African governments are the first source of infrastructure financing. In 2018, they represented 37% of total commitments. Yet, they cannot shoulder the entire burden, burden alone. Over-reliance on public funding runs the risk of increasing the debt burden of African countries. The gap is too large to be bridged by public funding alone, especially since public funding will come under greater stress due to the COVID-19 economic fallout. International organizations and development finance institutions, as well as donor countries, also play a key role in financing, and it's essential that they continue to do so. Yet to achieve their NDCs and bridge investment gap, African countries need to explore multiple financing sources and notably private funding. This is the first and uh, third highlight. Private capital has yet to be fully tapped for green projects in African markets. So the private sector has a financing capacity and skills, which represent an opportunity for African countries to scale up their climate action. For private investors, green projects in African markets could deliver attractive financial and impact returns. Yet at this stage, private sector involvement remains limited. In 2018, the private sector financed only 12% of infrastructure in Africa. Moreover, this partic their participation is usually limited to green projects with DFI investment and risk mitigation. Overall investment is currently limited by global regulatory changes that resulted from the 2008 financial crisis, local currency risk and persistent education gaps among investors. There is a potential that has still to be tapped. McKinsey notes that global and local investors have a growing appetite for green infrastructure projects in Africa. In particular, institutional investors, that is to say pension funds, insurance companies and sovereign wealth funds could play a greater role. They can invest through a variety of structures, through debt or equity, through direct or indirect channels, especially through investment funds. So how do we unlock greater private sector funding? This is my fourth highlight. To foster greater private sector involvement in green growth, it will be necessary to rely both on proven and innovative financial instruments. Given private investors' increasing appetite, there is significant room to scale up investors' involvement. It will rely on the right mix of instruments, both proven and innovative. So what are the main financial instruments? First of all, DFI support is key in catalyzing private sector financing through tools like 
guarantees or blend in finance since they mitigate risk, investment risk, such as regulatory, currency, and political risk, and help rebalance risk crowd profile. There are also green bonds, public private partnerships, and carbon pricing instruments. But I'm sure that our panelists will elaborate on these tools, and you can find out more in the report. Yet, DFIs, private investors, and African governments are only beginning to scratch the surface of potential financial innovation. Financial institutions in Africa have an opportunity to expand and diversify green product offerings while regulatory reforms could support this development. Given the dynamism of African financial markets, there is plenty of room for further innovation and balance sheet optimization to help meet the continent's climate finance needs. This could include, for instance, moving beyond conventional debt instruments. So this is just a rapid overview. I keenly invite you to read the report if you want to learn more. I can't wait to hear from our speakers to see what they think about the importance of climate finance to African countries, where are the challenges and opportunities, as well as what are instruments are particularly promising or well suited for African markets. So many thanks. And now I give the floor to Aubrey. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Rama, for setting us up for such a meaningful and important conversation today. It's really my honor to be moderating this discussion with our esteemed guests who look at this issue from a variety of positions. As Emily said, it takes everyone and everyone has a different role to play. So from the DFI community, where we're joined today by Jake Levine and Bertrand Valkiner, uh, who are going to speak for what governments are doing in terms of investing in infrastructure. Uh, from the investor community, we have uh, Terrier Videsen, who's uh, the CEO of ARM Harris, and Edmasu Tedese, the CEO and um, president of TDB, to speak about the investor point of view. And we have Sidi joining uh, from the investment bank side on sustainable finance. So really, we want to weave all of this together. And I want to jump in <clears throat> and have the first question go to Terrier to speak a little bit about the difference that you see between countries that are the, those that need to mitigate climate uh, issues because they are current uh, active contributors to carbon in the, uh, in the atmosphere and those that need to adapt to new realities. And I think there is often seen a divide between the mitigators and the adapters when it comes to climate finance. Terry, how are you seeing this from where you sit? Absolutely. Thank you, Aubrey, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for having me today. Um, you know, I've been investing in infrastructure for many years now, especially African infrastructure. And um, about uh, five, six years ago, I joined several climate think tanks and have been, you know, engaging in climate finance, climate infrastructure thinking for many years now. And um, the 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 approach to tackling climate change has been founded upon two key pillars that have been expanded upon over the years. And those two key, key pillars being mitigation and adaptation. And it's important to think about mitigation, which is the reduction of emissions and adaptation, which is adjusting to the impacts of climate change. When thinking about Africa, a lot of the time we have the constant refrain, which is Africa has the least contribution to emissions but is the most vulnerable. And vulnerability implies that the impacts of drought, flooding, um, weakness in land value, reduction in land value, and all these extreme weather events have these sustained negative impacts which move beyond extreme weather. And I think what you see in international markets is that adaptation um, requirements are a bit more straightforward around uh, making infrastructure more resilient to an extreme weather event. And the conversation tends to be more around insurance and how can you expand insurance to protect for a one, for, because normally you might insure against a once in a 1000 year storm and now that storm would happen every 50 years. So how do you change insurance metrics? Whereas in Africa, it's a lot more salient in that the issue of climate change affects fundamental livelihoods. 
it affects agriculture, it affects feeding, it affects food security, and it even affects security. A lot of the migration, a lot of the conflict that you're seeing in Africa is tied to access to water and to resources, a lot of which are changing because of climate change. And so while emissions and the reduction of emissions is so crucial to achieving the reduction in global warming. And there's been a lot of technology and finance that's going toward projects that reduce emissions, primarily through renewable energy, electric mobility, and others. There's a lot more need in Africa for helping us to adapt to a lot of the weaknesses and vulnerability that climate change has brought about. But what you'll also hear among the global community, as well as the African and developing markets is that adaptation projects are a lot more difficult to finance than mitigation projects. Because yeah. emissions yeah. mitigation projects will be a lot of the renewable energy projects for which a lot of influence, a lot of change, a lot of, of support has been provided for. Adaptation is a lot more elusive. We need a lot more data, a lot more thinking and a lot more solution orientation across both Africa as well as the developed markets to think and, and about how does that change how does that change the, uh, how you invest so you know ARM Harith is, is a private equity fund that invests in infrastructure how does it change how you actively invest every day well we are we do see infrastructure as an impact asset class and we're seeking to use our investments to make um, um, you know to impact uh, the, the sustainable development goals for which climate action is one of them. Um, energy access presents a tremendous opportunity in Africa. It's an, it's a great investment opportunity. but the reality is that energy access also goes into renewable energy. But when it comes to resilient infrastructure and climate, we need to look beyond renewable energy. It's actually relatively straightforward these days to invest in a renewable utility scale project. The challenges are around distributed energy access and also how do we think about more resilient urban infrastructure? How do we improve how we retrofit public transportation? How do we address buildings and, and developments? So the, the need to look at using a much broader lens as to what climate infrastructure means is something that we all need to focus on to truly have that broad reaching impact with respect to climate action and financing. it. Admasu, I'd like to bring you into this conversation because Terrier is bringing up some important issues. You know, for example, in a mega city like Lagos, you could one one point of view is you could build a road, a new road that would, in theory, lead to a lot more cars and more carbon. But in reality, in some places like Lagos, a new road might reduce traffic because that people will be able to get around quicker so they won't sit in traffic polluting the whole time. So there's often some kind of counterintuitive thinking that's required. And then, Maso, you sit across 20 plus countries. And, and how are you seeing uh, thinking about infrastructure investing differently in this new climate reality? You're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Aubrey. Uh, yeah, I think Terry really uh, provoked us and got the ball rolling. I, I thought maybe I would just uh, come in and, and, and just also point out that this is a, a very crucial time in the development journey of, of our continent. I think Ambassador Yada mentioned that there's going to be a great deal of growth, both economic growth, but of course, the demographics that go with it. And of course, there's a huge opportunity to leapfrog in a number of different ways. And, and of course, the, uh, the mitigation part is obvious because that's a huge part of the agenda. But of course, adaptation is often overlooked. And I think this is where transport systems in particular have a very important role to play, uh, not just in terms of decongestation of, of traffic, but also introducing smarter forms of transport, mass transit, but also freight transit where one can use electricity instead of fossil fuels, as an example. We've seen huge, huge uh, uh, opportunities in this part of Africa to actually press very strongly on, on the transport side. We, we have mega railroad projects uh, in Tanzania and in Ethiopia that are electric trains. They're not actually fossil fuel trains. So I think the kind of connectivity that those uh, mega projects bring in to, from the coast to the hinterland, connecting several African countries 
as a case in point. And, and, and so there's going to be uh, more of those opportunities. And I think there's, uh, uh, of course, a big case to be made to ensure that there's access to, to the right kind of capital to make these types of big projects work. Of course, it's and that infrastructure is key to unlocking the market, right? We're all talking about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the potential for the six trillion dollar market. Um, but without the infrastructure, it's disconnected. And African, you know, the challenge has been fragmentation from the beginning. As I always say, three percent of the world live in small landlocked countries. Thirty percent of Africans do. And so, if we don't have the infrastructure and figure out how to do traditional transport infrastructure in a more resilient way, you can't reduce the cost of doing business and unlock the markets uh, accordingly. And I think that also brings to your point, Terry, about expanding beyond just the green energy projects. And, and I want to bring in Jake and Bertrand because, and you know, and, and Masu as well to comment, you know, DFIs exist to be additional, additionality as part of their, their reason to exist, right? Doing things that the market wouldn't do alone. And if you know, more and more money is going into large scale solar, for example, how can DFIs catalyze um, investment in other areas that are more tricky, if you will, to, to the climate finance? So first, Bertrand, I'll, I'll turn to you to hear a little bit about what AFD is doing in the space. And then Jake, we'd love to hear how you're beginning to think of this at DFC. Bertrand. Thank you very much, uh, Aubrey, dear Ambassador Ramayad. To your colleagues, thank you for, and dear Atlantic Council, thank you for having me here today. Um, we've been investing over the last years 8 uh, billion euros in uh, climate finance in Africa because it is in our geographical mandate, the main continent and the main focus of our activities. When I speak about investing in climate, I'm referring to the Paris Agreement and looking at how projects, at how energy mix trajectories of countries are aligned with the Paris Agreement. So we've been focusing on looking on specific projects, such as the one that were mentioned by Emily Bell in her introduction, for instance, the Nashtigol Dam. And we are also looking at uh, solar panel projects, such as the one you just mentioned, uh, Aubrey. And it's obviously a, a very consistent way to accompany and to support the development of, uh, of uh, clean ways of producing energy in Africa. But we are also focusing on uh, financial intermediaries such as TDB. And I here would like to uh, commend the work made by uh, Mr. Tadese at the head of uh, TDB, working with uh, intermediaries, working with public development banks, working with institutions who know the field, who have been uh, working with uh, African counterparts, with African clients for over several years, decades sometimes. And we've partnered with uh, TDB in 2019 because of their experience of the field, because of uh, the commitment Mr. Tadesse uh, took in uh, wanting to transform the way his institution under his leadership is looking at uh, clean and green projects. So we have two ways to tackle uh, climate issues in uh, Africa and in the way we work. We either finance directly projects such, uh, such as uh, the dams, uh, solar panels, energy efficiency projects, and we work with uh, intermediaries such as public finance institutions. And the, the, what is important, and I was recently making a presentation saying that uh, AFD was providing 14 billion euros uh, per year of, uh, of investment. My, uh, the person I spoke with thought that this was a huge amount of money, and I said it was actually almost nothing as compared to the financing gap that uh, Emily Bell presented in her presentation. So what is important for us, and DFC is a partner of uh, subsidiary Proparco, what is important for us is see how we can mobilize on a much larger scale, private investors, public investors, and even um, local, uh, local uh, deposits of uh, people who've uh, placed their economies in their local banks. And our goal, together with uh, institutions such as TDB, is see how we can leverage on those uh, sums of money and how we can channel them into a green Paris compliant project. Thank you, Patron. Um, Jake, I mean, you're, you're following in the footsteps of, of many DFIs that have been quite active in Europe on uh, climate issues. 
And we know that the DFC is not just starting climate investing because you've come. There have been some investments made in the past in resilient infrastructure or even climate debt swaps and conservation bonds. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about you know, the current thinking and vision uh, at the DFC. Thank you, Aubrey, and thanks for the opportunity to join you today. First, let me just say congratulations to you and to the Atlantic Council and to Emily. This uh, report, Green Growth, is really a tremendous achievement and hugely insightful. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing it widely within the DFC and within uh, the U.S. Um, international climate finance uh, community. Um, merci, Ambassador Yad, uh, pour uh, votre introduction très gentille. That was very warm and generous of you. Um, and uh, let me just say, it is true. This is this is my first event um, uh, publicly. Um, speaking as the new uh, chief climate officer of the DFC. And that is not a coincidence. We are very focused on uh, contributing to all of the terrific, important, critical work happening on the continent. Uh, and I want to very much be a partner to all of you in doing that. Let me just briefly um, thank the colleagues of mine at the DFC who have been doing this for a long time. Uh, you, some of you may know them. I just want to say their names because they will be important partners to all of us as we're working together. Um, Jesse Karate in Washington, D.C., Vib Jane in Johannesburg, uh, Aparna Srivastav, who also newly joined um, as the Deputy Chief Climate Officer along with me at the agency here in Washington um, and comes to us from Mercy Corps. Um, so we're really excited to work together with everybody. Uh, and I appreciate um, uh, your acknowledgement of my uh, newness um, to this. I'm, I'm, I'm coming up to speed. Um, you know, the Biden administration has articulated a very clear goal to not just address climate change at home through an agenda that uh, includes investing trillions of dollars in new clean energy infrastructure and in resilience um, here, but also to rebalance our investments abroad so that we are shifting towards resilience, adaptation, clean energy mitigation, supporting uh, important goals such as um, uh, uh, the Green Climate Fund and others that have previously been articulated uh, at the UNFCCC and other um, uh, forums. And the work that the DFC is now beginning to articulate in terms of our targets is a central piece of what the administration uh, is planning to do on climate. Um, some of you may have seen that at the World uh, Climate Leaders Summit at the end of April, uh, the DFC announced that we would be uh, aiming for an ambitious net zero target to uh, reach um, carbon neutrality in terms of our investment portfolio by the year 2040. Um, that means that we would phase out of all fossil fuel um, uh, investments by the year 2030. Uh, we um, similarly announced that we are going to focus at least one third of our entire portfolio on projects with a clear climate nexus. A lot of that will include work around renewable energy, clean energy, uh, uh, um, and mitigation work. Uh, I appreciated Admasu's uh, admonition and recommendation on the, on the transport side of the equation because this um, presents a, a very compelling and important opportunity to, to bridge out of uh, our um, sort of historical focus area in the power sector. But there's a whole range of investments that we're going to be looking at uh, to meet that 33% target. Um, and and Jake, then, how do you see how do you see the DFC playing a role in being catalytic and trying to get other US investors? Um, we've talked often about the trillions that sit in US pension funds, many of which are aligned in a return uh, point of view from to infrastructure to think about uh, African markets and African opportunities. And we know from research that Americans tend to look at African opportunities from a lens of risk. Whereas, for example, Asian investors tend to look through a lens of opportunity. How can the DFC catalyze investment 
and bring in, you know, you have 60 billion, but you know, that's very small as well. And you gotta be able to bring in uh, far beyond that. So how do you see being catalytic in, in this space? Yeah, you, you just read my mind uh, that um, the next uh, point that I wanted to, to articulate was the importance that the agency is putting on and that the administration more broadly is, is emphasizing around mobilizing private capital. And we're working very closely with a broad team, not just at the DFC, but uh, with the special envoy for climate, John Kerry's team, uh, with our partners at the State Department and at Treasury, um, and at the other agencies that are able to help in this broad portfolio of essentially de-risking investments abroad, uh, helping the private sector gain a level of comfort with um, investing in new markets. Um, we are now sort of underway in terms of exploring these conversations very actively with other DFIs, with major institutional investors, um, pension funds, uh, for example, uh, private sector investors who have all very eagerly um, committed billions and in some cases tens of billions of dollars to invest in these exact types of projects. Uh, that makes a great segue to Courtney. I'd love to bring Courtney into the conversation uh, to hear a little bit about city city's footprint in the space and you know what you think it takes to bring more private sector players in uh, and what DFIs could do different, better, uh, or or kind of really amplify the work that you guys are doing. Thanks, Aubrey, and you know, thank you again um, to the Atlantic Council for having this panel. Um, all the other panelists have really hit on topics that are really um, at the center of, of my work and, and at the, the heart of City's goal, which is to help our, our clients globally um, transition to a low carbon economy so that we, we meet the, the Paris Agreement objectives. Um, City is the largest, or it's the most global bank. Um, and that poses a lot of opportunities um, but it also means that we have to view uh, our, our commitments, our uh, roadmap a little differently than, um, than institutions that might be in uh, developed economies only or, or um, in one or two countries only. Um, and what that means is that we, uh, we pride ourselves in working to bridge public and private sector, uh, particularly in emerging markets. And, um, and that's really what is needed in order to um, bring innovative finance instruments uh, that mobilize private capital. So um, just as some examples, um, we have some innovations uh, on the horizon. They're, um, they, they include things like, um, how do you bundle infrastructure investment in a way uh, that you can uh, include risk mitigation um, and incorporate structure and investable uh, vehicle that can be invested um, in by institutional investors who want that exposure to infrastructure in emerging markets. We really have to get away from a project by project finance approach and, and really think about how can we make infrastructure and low carbon infrastructure um, an asset class. So things like, um, uh, well, in Asia, um, Clifford Capital has a, a, a platform of CLOs investing in um, collateralized uh, loan obligations, which uh, to infrastructure. So it's, it's, it's actually bundling project finance loans to infrastructure in emerging markets. And then um, because uh, those CLOs incorporate hundreds of assets, it is uh, a, a good way to um, mitigate the risk and allow institutional investors um, to, to invest. Um, we're also, we're talking to um, TDB as, a, um, as, as an important partner on sustainable equities and, and how can we, again, in, in, the, in the equity space, create these um, investment vehicles that allow um, a, a scaling of, of um, 
of infrastructure projects, of um, climate finance, um, in a way that, again, can be investable uh, by institutional investors. Yeah, I think part of that is, is really trying to make what seem like exotic assets or, or challenging places something look normal to, uh, to the institutional investors, something they're used to seeing uh, and it take away just the Africa sell point, but make it something that looks like apples to apples, everything that they are you know, consuming all the time. And I think that innovation is important. And sometimes we all get caught up in the, in the Paris Agreement, like the level of ambition, the net zero targets level of ambition. But I think sometimes the issue comes down to doing and to innovation and actual financial pro products. Um, and uh, Terry, I'd like to, to kind of hear what you had thinking about what Courtney said about different structures or different products that could bring in additional capital. What do you think is currently missing in the kind of financial product space when it comes to infrastructure financing? Uh, sure. I mean, I'll speak from our perspective in that we're an infrastructure private equity fund and we invest in greenfield projects. And I think the issue with Africa is that Africa, the in Africa infrastructure opportunity is a greenfield opportunity. So you first have to deal with how do you develop, build and invest in greenfield opportunities? And then how do you structure finance financial instruments to sustain those assets into economies that have uh, foreign exchange depreciation and all sorts of other influences. Now we manage capital from the Nigerian domestic pension fund, as well as international capital. And we think that it's very important, not only for us to be mobilizing international DFI and international private capital, we also need to mobilize domestic private capital and for domestic and international capital to work hand in hand toward realizing green ambitions. And to be able to do this, there are some sort of precedents that have been set and there's also more that needs to be done. So I'll just touch on three. So one of them, of course, is the guarantee world where you have quite a few DFIs that are, are putting together guarantee funds that are excellent because you can mobilize um, larger pools of capital and we have a successful case of a guarantee fund actually in Nigeria that's mobilizing pension local pension fund capital into bond related instruments into local um, infrastructure assets we need more of that I always say the DFIs should become guarantee agencies so that we can mobilize the liquidity wall so think about that um, the other area that's been very interesting is around dealing with the greenfield and construction uh, period uh, gap. And so you have some interesting funds that are doing all equity financing to close the development uh, gestation period in terms of re reducing the time and taking the project through construction period for refinancing. What does this mean? We're using pension fund capital to refinance. A lot of DFIs don't like to refinance. Can we change the title to make DFIs more comfortable with refinancing? There are several DFIs that are, there are several organizations pushing for brownfield asset recycling. That's an example, but it's going well. Um, the other interesting one is performance-based grants. The World Bank has a very successful program in Nigeria today where they have a performance-based grant that pays you for every connection you make with a mini grid. And there's a lot of renewable energy used for improving access. That's also a successful program, but it needs equity. And so you find that there's still a gap and you actually need the whole ecosystem to work. I'd also like to touch on data. We need to improve data. We need to improve how we understand what the real mitigation issues are. What are the emissions levels? Um, how critical is that, um, road, that, that electric transportation project relative to other forms of say rural renewable energy? And let's also think about deforestation. Um, in Nigeria today, for example, you look at the satellites, apparently across Africa, forests are standing at about 55% the level they were about 15 years ago. If we actually had the data to show what are the impacts of deforestation and that impact on climate versus other forms of fuel, we just don't have the data. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done from a technical assistance standpoint. Uh, Masu, I'd like to bring you in because you've 
You also in TDB's kind of structure have local pension funds uh, and African pension funds and how we can kind of bridge and bring in local capital and international capital and what's needed to do that on a, on a greater scale. Yeah, I think I think that's an area that we've been very passionate about over the years because we we've always been an intermediary for international capital, but when you start going into risk capital, it's not as easy as raising debt capital globally. So what we did is we 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 really doubled down on on mobilizing risk capital within Africa, and that meant institutional capital, so pension funds, insurance companies. Uh, reinsurance companies, specialized uh, institutions. And so we had a great run over the past uh, seven or so years, uh, raising a, a very significant amount of capital from, from African institutional investors as a launch pad to, to reach out to institutional investors in the rest of the world uh, so that they would actually have the confidence uh, in that Africans have already taken the lead and have taken the risk and they've already had a very good run, good risk adjusted returns uh, over the years concerned. So blending and mobilizing private capital has always been uh, a, a strong focus area for us. And now we're reaching out beyond the continent. Uh, in fact, we just uh, brought on board a pension fund from Djibouti just a few months ago uh, at, the turn, at the end of 2020, at the height of the pandemic uh, of, of COVID. And, and we still were, were, were bringing on board institutional investors in our capital structure. We of course had to reform our capital structure to make it easy for them to come in. And of course, to ensure that there was a good triple bottom line value proposition. Uh, as many of you will know, typically DFIs uh, are impact investors. They're classically that way, but it's not always um, coming on a triple bottom line uh, basis in the sense that you can give good financial returns alongside, of course, the, the economic and social impact. And so, so that's been a great story for us. And, uh, and now we're having very promising conversations uh, with a whole range of institutional investors, including our traditional partners in Europe. I think it's so good to have Bertrand on the, on the line here today. We've worked very closely with AFD over the years, as well as the EIB. But now we're also looking at subordinated debt, uh, which would act as quasi equity in a way that we've not done before. And so great to have Courtney on the, on the call as well, because they're helping us think through some possible innovations. Uh, and this is, of course, to just build on the success we've had with our generic bonds that we've been issuing over the years. Uh, institutional investors have always bought into our euro bonds, and uh, we have a great track record, and there's always oversubscription there. But of course, we know that these days, capital needs to be segmented. You need different types of capital to complete the picture. And especially in order to, to, to get that growth uh, ratcheting up without just looking at debt. And, so and I'm also, Courtney, Courtney mentioned uh, the uh, first green equity instrument that you're trying to develop. What do you think is needed to really get it off the ground uh, in terms of finding traction in global markets? Aubrey, who's that a question to you? <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I'm hearing myself. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties there. I said, uh, on, and Masu, you were uh, mentioning this first kind of, and Courtney was mentioning the first green equity instrument. Uh, and I was wondering what it will take to get off the ground and have success in global markets. Well, maybe, maybe I can uh, kick off while, uh, Courtney is, is coming in. I, just to let you know, we are looking at both tier one and tier two capital. And uh, what we were discussing uh, with City as a, as a, as a long-standing partner of TDB is, is, is to look at the scope and the opportunities for introducing this kind of instrument onto the global markets. And, uh, and City, of course, um, gave us uh, reason to be optimistic and to be, to be uh, you know, uh, encouraged to pursue uh, that particular line. This is, of course, separate from the green shares that we're looking at, which is which is not quasi equity, which would be full a full equity instrument, but with some special features uh, to enable partners uh, to come in on that without taking a full equity instrument. But there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity we think for for crowding in 
institutional investors into platforms that are investment grade rated, which is what we offer as TDB, as you would know. So I think it's one thing to ask institutional investors, pension funds from Chicago or, or California to come in and buy you know, equity into a classic B rated you know, economic environment, as opposed to coming into an investment grade space where you actually have uh, a much uh, better risk profile. Well, one of the things I think is so critical is that we are getting to the nuts and bolts and the tactical, you know, technical issues here on what it takes for climate finance. And I think it's what it's what we envision in our kind of inclusive uh, green strategy is to uh, really get the best ideas around. And so, Courtney, I'd love to see if you have anything more on what Admasu said, uh, and then we'll step back a little bit and talk about just transition. Sure. I, I mean, look, there's. There's a lot um, that we can do in the equity markets, particularly in, in the, the public markets. Um, I, I think we've seen the, the green bond market really scale over the past 15 years. And you know, the equity markets are, are still, I think there's, there's a great room for innovation. Um, just a couple of, of, of interesting facts. Impact, the impact strategies have the highest rate of growth in assets under management. We're seeing um, big, uh, not only in private equity, but, but in listed equities, which is uh, extraordinary. Um, mainstream investors setting up uh, all sorts of green um, strategies, but impact even, uh, which is at the, at the far end of the, of the ESG scale. And so um, I think there's, there's great, room and opportunity and interest um, from institutional investors um, to, to really innovate in uh, the, the public equities markets. Um, and that could be through listed funds, um, with, you know, which we, we do see, uh, but there's obviously more, there's, there's much more room for uh, additional players. It could be um, a new a share class uh, for for those investors um, who want to really be part of the, the climate transition. And, and one thing I'll say is it takes organizations like TDB, um, like other DFIs, um, AFD, I know uh, it, in, um, it is right there in DFC, um, that together harmonize the, the definitions of climate finance. So we really, as, a, as markets, need the credibility from uh, DFIs around what do we consider um, climate mitigation, what do we consider uh, climate adaptation. And that, uh, from the development finance community, is really important. Yeah, we have to be careful with those definitions and, that, and have input, for sure, because it's easy to, to kind of come up with something on paper that excludes giant parts of, of the development story in Africa, uh, particularly around industrialization. And it, it brings us to the question of what is a just transition? And what does it look like when you have countries that are under-industrialized? Most African countries are less industrial today than they were in 1980, um, save some, some exceptions like Ethiopia and others. Um, but you know, you, you, how are we going to create jobs for the 1 million Africans that turn 18 every month without some kind of manufacturing and industrial growth? So industrialization is part of the just transition. But at the same time, if we don't get that part of the definition of what, you know, resilient infrastructure looks like, then that could be left out. Just the same way I'm highly skeptical on all this, you know, trillions going to impact. But you know, it's just like the way it's defined, it's not necessarily taking on early stage greenfield risk on infrastructure like Terrier uh, mentioned. Um, so uh, Terrier, we spoke a little bit about what just transition looks like. Uh, give us some of your thoughts. Sure. You know, the, it's a, one of the new phrases. So there, like I said, there's a new phrases coming up all the time. And um, it's um, sort of something that in the developed markets is thought of a lot more around the justice for jobs and about um, ensuring that just through the climate transition that um, the role of workers and the societal impact of the transition to 
uh, low carbon or climate conscious investments will take into cognizance jobs. But as that, as studies have evolved, and um, I'm a member of the UNPRI Committee on Infrastructure, and there's a, quite a lot of work that the UNPRI is doing around just transition for Africa. Because the reality is that many African countries are going to have to repurpose their entire economy. Whereas some countries like South Africa are completely energized by coal. And some countries like Nigeria receive all their foreign exchange from um, fossil fuel, oil and gas. And so it's, it goes much further than just repurposing jobs for a sector. They're actually seek, speaking about repurposing an entire economy for a green future. And what does that look like? And how do you invest in that? And how do you support that? And how do you create strategies for that type of transition? And so those conversations have been really interesting because I've heard some very interesting things even around, you know, should green bonds support not only renewable energy, but can, can certain countries that have been using, you know, have been uh, um, extracting fossil fuel that are now focused on extracting battery minerals actually qualify by virtue of repurposing their economy away from fossil into battery minerals. But you don't think about battery minerals as being green because there are issues with how it's produced and whether it's green, but does it factor into the just transition for the purpose of repurposing economies and how they are going to fit into a green future? And those same battery minerals are what's making, you know, economies greener in the mitigation countries, right? Because it's the batteries that are going to be the self-driving cars, the electric vehicles, batteries really empower solar. I mean, at the end of the day, are you in the solar business or are you in the battery business? And those battery minerals are coming from African countries. So Jake, at the DFC, how are you kind of having these discussions and taking yourselves out of remembering what realities are different in emerging markets and frontier markets? Sure, um, and let me just briefly comment on the earlier discussion too, uh, sure. just to say that on the topic of uh, really mobilizing capital and crowding in finance from the private sector and elsewhere, there are uh, three things I just want to put on everybody's radar that the DFC is working on. One, we're working on developing blended finance platforms, including for a regional platform that would focus on Africa and how uh, the DFC as um, uh, uh, sort of playing the DFI role uh, within a, a structure of different asset classes can help to bring in, whether it's additional debt, equity, insurance, uh, grant funding um, to de-risk uh, projects and markets overseas. So we, we want uh, folks to be a part of that process. Uh, we're also working on a risk sharing platform specifically for our insurance products, uh, which play uh, in a really important role in terms of, um, you know, thinking about some of these resilience questions and ensuring against uh, some of the more sort of finance sector focused risks. And then finally, I just want to note, we've got a $50 million technical assistance fund. Um, and I've heard a number of folks talk about, um, you know, how to think about some of the pre-financing activities that sometimes pose hurdles to achieving finance, um, technical feasibility studies, um, grant financing that can help uh, advance specific projects, but also uh, broader sort of finance tools. So I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that. Um, the just transition, this question is central to the work that, that we are doing. Um, and I think that everybody at the DFC recognizes that in the emerging market context, um, particularly when we're talking about I think some, uh, Ambassador Yad uh, mentioned that Africa accounts for less than 4% of global emissions. And we know that Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for less than 1% and that there are nearly 600 million people um, who do not have any electricity. Uh, and that energy really serves as a bridge to um, not just achieving goals in public health, but also economic development. Um, and so, you know, this is 
something that we are focused on. We feel that there are very important opportunities to uh, provide that kind of access to electricity using clean energy uh, technologies, bringing in additional capital to solve some of the hard problems, like for example, how now in the United States, you can build a solar plus storage uh, base load sort of reliability facility that will compete with natural gas on the natural, no pun intended, uh, but that in um, emerging markets, bringing in that storage component, which is really the linchpin to reliability, is very difficult. It's much more expensive. And so how can DFIs like the DFC provide that additionality so that we're not just doing another um, solar project, but we're also adding in storage? And that applies you know, across the board to some of the most innovative um, technology questions that we have in clean energy and also um, this sort of more vexing question of how are we going to finance adaptation and resilience. Um, I do just want to say uh, on the on this sort of the, the broader topic, um, we, you know, the Biden administration has really put racial equity and um, justice at the core of its climate mission. And so I just want to reiterate that that may hold true in the United States and it and it absolutely holds true in our work abroad as well. And um, so we are focused on this and would like to be uh, partnering with everybody on this call to achieve um, the kinds of outcomes that I think we're all very aligned on. Yeah, we've had some questions from the audience about why there hasn't been even more investment in, in solar renewable energy projects in Africa. Um, I assume that part of the challenge is a lot of those need still distribution and transmission infrastructure. Um, uh, Terry, would you like to speak a little bit to, to large scale renewable and what you've seen and what's holding back the sector? Uh, I don't think um, large scale renewable is, is um, th there are investments in large scale renewable. I mean, uh, Bertrand uh, mentioned Nastigal. It was an excellent um, hydro project that uh, closed a couple of years ago. And then the IFC has a scaling solar program, which has also deployed uh, quite a lot of capital. I think just uh, last year, the data showed about 60% of FDI went to energy for 2019. Um, and I don't have the data, but a large proportion was to renewable. I think the challenge is that we are getting to a point of a generation uh, bottleneck where we actually have increasing amount of generation without enough of the distribution capability to deploy it. And then indeed also with renewable energy, you still need the base load factor. And for us, the cost of storage just hasn't fallen enough um, you know, to be able to sort of fit into a PV framework as such. And so a lot of the, you know, sovereigns that would back a utility scale renewable energy project are beginning to shy away from the type of obligations that would need to backstop a 20 or 30 year PPA, even though the tariffs are falling and the cost of debt is equally low. So there's a bit of care being taken though there is still a fair deal of large-scale activity in South Africa, for example. But what we're seeing in the rest of um, you know, the, the countries that are taking a bit of a pause is an increase in distributed energy. And so the distributed renewable energy, distributed solar, and this more decentralized energy solutions as a way to circumvent the distribution volume is what you see a lot of projects um, effectively taking on and we have a lot of those in our pipeline so we've really been focused on uh the investment piece and obviously it's critical um but what about mark carbon markets and you know will there be we have a question from the audience you know will will this become a trade issue carbon emissions and credits become a trade issue and people often talk about the the potential of the congo basin uh, and its ability to kind of hold in and take out a lot of the carbon that's being emitted by the uh, developed countries. You know, can African countries generate a lot of finance from uh, carbon markets? 
And so, uh, Admasio, I'll turn to you, Bertrand, Jake, anyone who wants to comment on the, the carbon markets piece uh, so that we can make sure we answer Nathan's question. Well, I think it's a fascinating question, Aubrey. I, I look forward to hearing from the colleagues if there's any specific new ideas or insight on that, because it's not really been an area that has uh, moved as well as we had all liked to. Uh, but I just thought I would uh, just salute uh, Jake for, for, for the mix of instruments that the DFC is embracing very quickly. Uh, for a young DFI to quickly come in with with such instruments, I think really is, 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 is commendable because one of the things that uh, we don't always like to admit as DFIs is we, we tend to stick to our comfort zones and, and, and just do a whole lot of senior debt. We, we don't like risk capital as much and we don't like the pre-financing stuff as well. And that takes a little bit more uh, innovation and, and, and a more proactive mindset. Uh, even working with developers, project developers, even private equity funds have, you know, uh, challenges in terms of finding uh, projects that are ready for, for investment. They also need project developers and, and there's not enough of those in the continent. And so we all need a little bit more risk appetite in that regard, but just a passing comment. <laughs> Jake. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate that, Admasu, and, and I, I didn't even have a chance to mention our new uh, authority to make equity investments, which was something that the um, enabling statute that created the DFC, the Build Act, um, allows us to do. And we're now uh, deep in conversations about some of the, the, the bigger questions that, that raises in terms of what our risk appetite <clears throat> looks like, what it should look like, how we should be thinking about innovation more broadly. And it really dovetails with our net zero commitment, because on the one hand, we've got projects that are going to be emitting fossil uh, emissions as the result of burning fossil fuels. And so how are we thinking about nature-based solutions and investing in the innovation that we need there? Let me just comment um, briefly on carbon markets. Um, I'm not going to uh, say anything about the, uh, any developments in the Biden administration, but I, but I think that there are a few uh, potentially instructive models to look at that are existing elsewhere. I. Uh, I'm from California, so I can't um, uh, resist the temptation to raise a couple of uh, tools that have been underdeveloped and uh, under development in California and that have really, I think, proven to be interesting models in how to raise revenue by pricing carbon. We have, um, in particular, something called the low carbon fuel standard, which focuses on uh, fuels, the Primarily, the regulated entities are petroleum uh, producers, uh, uh, refiners, distributors, uh, all the way down to the retail level. And there is a, a statutory cap on the price of carbon in this market is $200 a ton. That market has reached its cap. Carbon is now trading in California for $200 a ton. And when you stack that $200 up against something like the federal tax credit 45Q in the United States, which state, states which, which provides um, a price for carbon on projects, including carbon removal, um, you can start really getting creative in terms of investing in riskier and more capital intensive technologies to think about decarbonization. Um, there's also a cap and trade market in, in California, which is economy wide um, and has a, now a price of about 17 or 18 dollars a ton. Um, so, in case anybody is curious, I would encourage you to look at um, California, the Air Resources Board, and a number of the regulations there to think about creative methods in carbon pricing. And Courtney, you've just uh, moved from Asia. Uh, Asian countries have been uh, leaders in in some of the uh, carbon markets. Uh, is there anything you think that could be learned from the experience in the emerging markets in Asia that African countries can apply or how they can benefit from those markets that are happening elsewhere? Um, great question. I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, immediately what comes to mind are the incredible natural resources that, that Africa has. Um, you mentioned the Congo basin, um, but many countries uh, across the continent have uh, really uh, impressive natural resources 
carbon, natural carbon sinks um, that could be monetized. And, and we are seeing um, a lot of interest uh, globally from multinational corporates um, who are looking to secure offtake agreements uh, in the voluntary carbon markets. Um, so I, I think the, you know, the, the opportunity is immense. And um, I think the key to unlocking that opportunity is, is really to, uh, is to work with credible carbon standards in the voluntary markets. Bertrand, any thoughts on this issue? Yes, thank you very much. Among the comments that were made today, I see uh, four main areas where we are all focusing and that will um, pave the way for the emergence of a carbon market in Africa. First of all, I think there's the issue of the financial markets. And here I was referring to uh, the partnership that we have with uh, TGB. You have to know that there are, there are 94 uh, public development institutions in Africa. They represent 25 billion US dollars of uh, annual investment. And as I mentioned earlier, they represent a very strong network that has a, that is deep rooted in the field and has a very good knowledge of its countries, of its sectors and geographies of intervention. And to my, um, and, and our conviction at the AFD is that they represent partners with whom we definitely need to work with and that will be key stakeholders in the emergence of a, of a carbon market if that road is, has to be taken. The second issue for me to see the development of a carbon market is a very strong political drive. Um, there are countries in Africa that uh, are very in interested in this. Uh, for instance, we've identified the 12 African countries that have a framework for green bonds and the ability to issue a green bonds. Uh, we recently worked with DBSA who issued its first green bond earlier this year. Um, and there are other countries who've already put that from those frameworks in place, which shows a very clear interest in climate finance and the idea that you need very strong regulatory frameworks to be able to, uh, to, um, to, to develop those kind of markets. The third issue goes back to standardization. It was mentioned by Courtney. In order to have a very specific asset class that attracts investors, you need predictability in terms of legal, financial, technical uh, issues, and you also need public support. And this is where I think it's very interesting. Uh, Jake Levine mentioned it's a TA uh, fund. I think it's very useful when DFI can bring um, grant, grant money to fund the preparation phase of the projects, because this is where funding is very critical. And this is, in the end, will lead to the success or to the failure of any kind of a greenfield infrastructure project. So it's very good to hear that there are, that, that there are important sums of money available to fund those preparatory phases, because that will, in the end, help transform ideas into very concrete infrastructure projects and that will enable us to bring more private capital into those projects. And finally, um, I was specifically mentioning private capital. Um, public finance will not be enough, definitely, to fund all uh, the infrastructure projects that have been uh, mentioned and to fund the infrastructure gap. So we need private capital. We need private capital from, from international investors. We need private capital from domestic investors. It's very important to secure a project and we need political awareness in African countries looking at the development of their own private sector. The, <clears throat> what we've observed in some countries is that the local private sector is so small that it's not strong enough to be a, uh, a force that will drive, that will encourage, that will defend its interest vis-a-vis -vis its own government. So we need very, uh, a very strong SME network and a very strong SME network that is represented at the political level and that will be able to influence what um, uh, leaders uh, are doing in terms of legislation and in terms of regulatory issues. And you were mentioning, Aubrey, at the introduction of this conference, the summit that will take place to, tomorrow in Paris. One of the, there are several issues that will be uh, discussed. Uh, between the uh, state leaders. Um, one of them goes directly to how to support the development of the 
African private sector and how to make sure that the development of small and medium enterprises will be sufficient to give jobs to those millions of people who are turning 18 or 20 something and who will be looking for jobs in the years to come because it will neither be the big large companies who will provide the necessary jobs it won't be the public administration from uh, african countries that will provide the jobs so we need to focus on how smes will be able to develop will be able to grow economically to grow to green grow economically so that in the end they will they will provide economic uh, jobs and opportunities for all those people who have energy and who want to build africa in the future so that's well, be very one of the interesting to see how sme voice are represented tomorrow uh in the last few minutes uh that we have i'd love to go around to our other speakers and here you know you were trying you mentioned the importance of political will tomorrow we'll hear from presidents uh, many African presidents will be there. Uh, I think Janet Yellen's attending. I and mean, we have so many uh, robust conversation happening tomorrow on the question of sustainable finance for African countries. So I just want to go around to the rest of our uh, uh, panel and see what you would like to see. Now, speaking in your personal capacity, um, but what you would like to see come out of this summit uh, tomorrow. Uh, and you know, where are the areas of innovation? What's giving you hope right now on this uh, on the climate fund uh, front? So Courtney, I'll start with you. So well, I'm on a mantra these days, which is um, we need more public private participation. Uh, so public private collaboration at unprecedented levels. Excellent. And Masu, what would you like to see come out tomorrow? Well, I, I, I think what will come out uh, most likely is a scale-up uh, agreement to push the, the envelope. I think everybody knows in a post-COVID world, specifically for the African continent, you know, scale is very, very important. And I think the, there's an exciting discussion with the IMF around special drawing rights. I think that would be a wonderful outcome to see reallocations of SDRs. To, to various financial institutions who can actually do much more uh, to scale up as badly uh, as is needed. But I just wanted to, to close out by saying scale alone is not enough. I think we need to speed up and synergize. And I think synergization means partnerships. Uh, partnerships, not just at the global level, but also on the African soil, because I think Bertrand has uh, very aptly highlighted the, the, the presence and existence of some 100 public development institutions in Africa on the ground. Many of these are in low-income countries, in fragile countries, the hardest to reach places in the development space. And I think, again, we need risk appetite. And I hope Jake has success in, in, in generating uh, some healthy risk appetite at the DFC uh, alongside the Europeans and others. Jake, over to you. Well, I definitely uh, agree with uh, the the other uh, comments, um, and I, I suppose I would just add, I think it has been, um, from, from my perspective, a real sea change inside the DFC to have um, taken some bold targets around net zero and investment goals. And I see the way that this agency, which has dedicated professionals, many of whom have been here either at OPIC or at USAID uh, previously working for, you know, in some cases, 25 years, that they have taken these goals to heart. They've adopted them into their own personal mission. And it is critical to the work that we will be doing for the next 5, 10, 15 years. And so if uh, uh, President Macron or uh, others would wish to adopt similar uh, targets, I think that that would go a long way to um, sort of turning the ship uh, incrementally in the right direction. Thanks, Terry, and then we'll turn to Emily because we want to hear her views after writing this excellent report. Thank you, Aubrey. I'd like to see um, an emphasis on the three pillars that matter most for Africa, environment and climate action being one, social, jobs, poverty alleviation being the second, and governance in the perspective of inclusivity and inclusivity in leadership being the third. And those three pillars being the drivers of sustainability and how we define sustainable investments. 
ultimately the ecosystem for the entire capital allocation toward infrastructure is crucial. And I would like to see a lot more emphasis around the entire ecosystem across the capital structure, across public and private, as to how we drive financing for those three pillars. Thank you. Emily, we want to give you, you know, this uh, your views on the summit tomorrow and what you would like to see out, out of, come out of it, given that you've spent so much time on this issue recently. We'd love your expert views, and then uh, I will close. Okay, many thanks, Aubrey, and, and many thanks to all participants. The debate was very interesting, and, and thanks a lot. Um, maybe what I would like to see, to hear tomorrow at the Paris Summit um, would be something around the participation of the private sector. I think it was part of my report, it was part of the discussion today. Then things, for me, it's very important to have this issue um, discussed tomorrow, so um, I look forward to, to, the, to the press release of the summit. Thanks, Aubrey. Yeah, and we know that government has a very important role in signaling uh, to the private sector and de-risking things just by keeping focus on it and continuing the conversation. So um, that's part of what we do at the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council is bring private sector with government and try to come up with really specific things to move ahead on some of the greatest challenges. So it's been my pleasure to moderate this panel with the esteemed guests today. And I thank everyone for, for joining on behalf of the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day and evening.